Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and of course, with a lot of history about Isaiah himself. This is lesson number three in that series entitled, When Your World is Falling Apart. Hmm, that doesn't sound too friendly, does it? This is a lesson for January 16 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now, recognizing the challenges that Isaiah lived through in his day and his family as well. I'm sure we can't fully comprehend the incredible difficulties there were in those days, but help us to try to grasp whatever we can so that we can better understand the words that he's written and preserved for us. Be with us now as we study together that we may come nearer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Young King Ahaz, the son of Jotham and grandson of Uzziah, had just taken control of the kingdom of Judah. He was an evil king. Notice these words that Isaiah wrote about him. Jim? When King Ahaz, the son of Jotham, and grandson of Uzziah ruled Judah, war broke out. Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, attacked Jerusalem, but were, were unable to capture it. When the word reached the king of Judah that the armies of Syria were already in the territory of Israel, he and his people were so terrified that they trembled like trees shaking in the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, Take your son Shear, Jashub, and go to meet King Ahaz. You will find him on the road where the cloth makers work at the end of the ditch that brings water from the upper pool. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. We're going to talk about this a little bit more later. But <clears throat> here's God giving instructions to Isaiah ex exactly where the king is right now. And this upper pool, is that, is that the pool, or, or was it Gihon Spring? Is that where well, that would be? Well, probably from? not. They had a lot of, a lot of um, reservoirs that they, where they preserve rainwater and so forth. So I, it could be, but you can't tell for sure. It's outside Jerusalem, though. Gihon would, in, in Isaiah's day, in the early days of Isaiah here, it would have been outside of the wall. Okay. Yeah. okay, tell him to keep alert, to stay calm, and not to be frightened or, or disturbed. The anger of, the, of King Reason and his Syrians and of P King Pika is no more dangerous than the smoke from two smoldering sticks. <laughs> Syria, together with Israel and its king, has made a plot. They intend to invade Judah, terrify the people into joining their side, and then put Tabeel's son on the throne. But I, the Lord, declare that this will never happen. Why? Because Syria is no stronger than Damascus, its capital city, and Damascus is no stronger than King Rezin. As for Israel, within 65 years it will be t too shattered to survive as a nation. Israel is no stronger than Samaria, its capital city, and Samaria is no s stronger than King Pika. If your faith is not enduring, you will not endure. American Bible Society, 1992. I'm going to ask you a, a theoretical question, but it's not so a theoretical. It's, it's an ethical question. How does God know, how did God make sure the children of Israel won the battles when he was in charge or when they're following his directions and he didn't win the battles when they were not following? Does God actually guide arrows? Does he guide missiles? Does he, what do you think? I think there might be a limit as to how much God is involved. When God says in Genesis 1, two places it says, take dominion. Now, that, I think, I don't want to limit God's foreknowledge, but uh, if he does too much manipulation, uh, mm -hmm. You know, then then why didn't he do a better job in many instances? 
if he's got if he's got if he's con really directing that closely. Yeah, well, and that's true. On the on, on the other hand, one of the things that the whole great controversy is about is, you know, what what happens when you got the devil loose, yeah. you know, what he's what he does, and. Um, well, the devil but, uh, has a lot of power. Lot in of one place he says, I know even the very number of your hair. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, he knows, um, but sometimes he intervenes. Well, take the, the oldest book, the book of Job. Yeah. Hey, have you considered my servant Job? A right, he's a righteous and upright man. Two yeah. times, in two, chapter was one, chapter kind of, two. Was it kind of uh, taunting Satan, saying, hey, Probably. Well, you know, really, <laughs> I feel so. I, I think there's some... Uh, well, uh, it, it's, it's, well uh, I mean, there. okay, let's, let's think about that. God is standing before the representatives of the entire universe on that occasion. Right. And here comes Satan. And they know what Satan's been up to. They have a pretty good idea. And he's saying, God says, Satan, uh, where I, you see, been? I, I see you here. I <laughs> see where you been, what you been doing. Uh, have you thought about my servant Job? And you know, obviously, this is this message is for all those other people listening. And the purpose of the message was he was educating all the others. Yeah. Okay. God is a teacher, mm -hmm. not a penalty payer. Yeah. Can he? Can you? Can he taunt Satan about I I, us? No, about about me. Say, have it. Well, if he, he, if the infinite one. I, I refer to as the infinite one. I don't limit really? God's foreknowledge, and I don't know what finite being it really can limit the foreknowledge right. of the infinite one. So, uh, because he's oper the infinite is operating at a different level than the rest of us. Surely. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Well, well Carrie, the, let's go on with the story. What led to this message from Isaiah? It was a pretty, pretty potent message. I mean, you go to the king. You know, kings in those days were inclined to chop off your head if they didn't like what you said. Right. I'm reading from 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 37 through 38. It was while he was king that the Lord first sent King Reason of Syria and King Pekar of Israel to attack Judah. Now I'm going to interrupt there again. Who sent who? It says the Lord. Yeah. The Lord sent Reason and Pekah. So what's, what's going on there? Was that God's plan? I think he was pitting one, one lot against the other here and there. I don't know about all the time. He was trying to, he was trying to tell them which end was up, and they didn't always listen to him. Right. Put it bluntly. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna be one of the things we're gonna struggle here in the next few chapters is is how 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 does God behave in times like this? Oh, anyway, go ahead. Jotham died and was buried in the royal tombs in David's city, and his son Ahaz succeeded him as king. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, Charles, you have some more information there. King Urizen of Syria and King Pekah of Israel attacked Jerusalem and besieged it, but could not defeat Ahaz. At the same time, the king of Edom reigned controlled Regained. Con regained control of the city of Elah, it Elath, mm -hmm. and drove out the Judeans who lived there. The Edomites settled in Elath and still live there. Okay, so now let's let's think about this. Here's here is Judah. It's a relatively small country, and they've got people. They've got a combined, very powerful force attacking them from the north. They have the Philistines attacking from them from the southwest. They have the, Elam the Edomites attacking them from the f southeast. I mean, what do you do? Yeah. I mean, this is just crazy. Okay. The kingdoms of northern Israel, Ephraim and Syria, Aram, ganged up on the smaller country, country of Judah to the south. This ha happened when uh, Judah was weakened by attacks from the Edomites and Philistines. So there they are, Israel four weakened. nations against them, coming from different directions. In the past, Judah had fought against Israel, but an alliance between Israel and Syria presented an overwhelming peril. In 
It appears Israel and Syria wanted to force Judah to participate with them in a coalition against the mighty power of Tiglath Pilsar of Assyria called Pul in 2 Kings 15 19, who continued to threaten them with his expanding empire. Israel and Syria had put aside their long-standing struggles against each other in view of a greater danger if they could conquer Judah and install a puppet ruler there. Isaiah 7, 5, and 6, they could use its resources and manpower. That's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, January 10. So you can see that there was plenty of reason for Ahaz to be, his, his, his knees to be knocking together. I mean, nations attacking him from every direction. So you, try to imagine yourself in such a hazardous situation. Well, what did Ahaz propose to do about it? 2 Kings 16, 7-9, Ahaz sent men to tiglath pileser the emperor of Assyria, with this message, I am your devoted servant. Come and rescue me from the kings of Syria and of Israel who are attacking me. Ahaz took the silver and gold from the temple. What temple is this we're talking about? Solomon's temple. This is Solomon's temple. And the palace treasury, and sent it as a present to the emperor. tiglath pileser in answer to Ahaz's plea, marched out with his army against Damascus, captured it, killing King Rezin, and took the people to Kerr as prisoners. Wow, and so the story progresses. Jim? Second Chronicles 28, 16 and 17. The Edomites began to raid Judah again and captured many prisoners. So King Ahaz asked Tiglath-Pileser, the emperor of Assyria, to help, to send help. Wow, so now he's got people at him from every direction. The only one he's, he's not asking help for, for from, from Tiglath Pleaser for is the Philistines. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is desperate t times. And, and of course, we know that he, he made the right choices about what to do. Um, well, Time-wise, um, Assyrian kings, Senator of Kim, 185,000 people. Dead. Okay, that's going to happen about. Uh, that's up. It's still yeah, that's still away. Maybe not too far. about tw about twenty, about thirty years still yeah. in the future. Not too, right. I okay. wanted that too. Of course, that will be the end of Assyria's military. Right. Yeah. Well, the country of Assyria, with its capital Nineveh, was the big bully, trying to conquer all the nations around the Middle East in the days of Isaiah. And if you look at the history of the world, you really look at what really happened. We, because of, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we tend to think there was Babylon was the first great empire. Assyria was a pretty awesome empire before that, and Egypt was quite an awesome empire before that. Mm. So if you're really looking, uh, if you're looking at the larger picture, not just what happened starting with Nebuchadnezzar on, you really need to say Egypt, Assyria, then Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and so forth like this. But of course, in, in, in Daniel's day, uh, Egypt and, and Assyria were already history. You know, it's amazing that uh, there was Isaiah, a major prophet. Who else was this? Jeremiah? At uh, that same time, you mean? Yeah, right. No, oh. the other prophets in that time, the other... The other um, Minor prophets. Minor prophets were were Hosea yeah. and um, Micah, I think, in the north. No, Micah was in the south. There was Isaiah and Micah were kings in the south, prophets in the south, and the Hosea and one other one, I can't remember one right now off of hand, were prophets in the north. So there are four prophets actively prophesying the days of Isaiah. The 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 king of of um, I mean, Jeremiah wasn't a prophet until about a hundred years later. Later. Okay. But the amazing thing, though, that uh, th 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 they saw the presence of God. The, the prophet was there. Mm -hmm. And yet, Ahaz goes for help somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was his own man. Well, sometime later, uh, the nation of Assyria would overrun the country of Judah as well, leaving only the city of Jerusalem with its high walls protected. 
And of course, that was what you're asking about, Charles. As we know, later on in history, Hezekiah and Isaiah took that problem to the Lord and the Lord solved it. So this is still in the days of Isaiah. This is near the end of Isaiah's reign, but in the, the, the story we're talking about is right near at the beginning of his reign, and the Hezekiah-Isaiah thing with the 185,000 Assyrians, that's the end of, his, of Isaiah's prophecy. But Ahaz decided to send a lot of money taken from the temple treasury to try to convince tiglath pileser to at attack this country of Syria so they would stop attacking him. Tiglath Pileser accommodated him very well, and Ahaz's enemies, with their usual or unusual alliance, were defeated. It might have looked like Ahaz had saved Judah. What do we know about the history of Ahaz, Jim? Second Kings sixteen three and four. And following the example of the kings of Israel, he even sacrificed his own son as a burnt offering to idols. Mm imitating the disgusting practice of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land as the Israelites advanced. Okay, let's, I'm going to interrupt, interrupt there for a second again. So here we have a king in the south, the southern kingdom of Judah, who's evil and he's following the practices of the northern kingdom. And remember, every single one of the kings of that northern kingdom were evil. There was not a single one that was good. Okay. Now, maybe about four of the southern kingdom were... Yeah, there are only about four in the four, southern kingdom that right. were, were fairly good and kings. And a few others were kind of yeah. wishy-washy. But here, the, here he is now, the king of Israel, as the example for the people who are sacrificing his own children. Mm. Okay? At the pagan places of worship, on the hills and under every shady tree, Ahaz offered sacrifices and burnt offerings. This can be burnt incense. Wow. Well, this is similar to uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, yeah. verses 25. Yeah. And then three places in Jeremiah uh, reference the same, the same thing. So you got Ezekiel, all this, this stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I like the way the uh, 1984 edition of um, the NIV says, I gave them over to laws by which they could not have life. They caused their firstborn to go through the fire. Mm -hmm. Well, what are we doing today? Yeah. What do we do with with, uh, with uh, abortions and uh, wars? Mm -hmm. We've cut some not cut down on the wars, but what do you do? You send your your young your young men to out to war. Yeah. So anyway, is it a whole lot different? I guess that's why I was raising the the issue. Okay, Carrie, Second Chronicles twenty eight. Yes, Second Chronicles twenty eight verses two through four, and followed. The example of the kings of Israel. Okay, so this is, we're talking about Ahaz now. He followed what? He, in brackets, Ahaz had metal images of ba Baal made, burned incense in the valley of Hinnom, and even sacrificed his own sons. That caught my eye. You hear about one, but he must have had several, didn't it? Mm. As burnt offerings to idols, imitating the disgusting practice of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land as the Israelites advanced. At the pagan places of worship, on the hills and under every shady tree, Ahaz offered sacrifices and burned incense. That's from the Good now, News Bible. I want you to think about that. On top of every hill and under every shady tree, they're worshiping pagan idols. Yeah. And by putting up little monuments and that kind of stuff, I mean, that is just... And the king himself is yeah. doing this yes. of all things. Yes. Well, I wonder though, were sacrifices still going on in Solomon's temple at the same time? Yeah, probably. A relative. Well, we're going to find out at the end of this story, they, he just closed the temple down. Closed it down completely. Ahaz was a descendant of King David to the royal line, but he obviously did not take David's attitudes toward God seriously at all. What about us? When we find ourselves in trouble, do we have sufficient faith to trust God? Jeremiah 12, verse 5, which was written about 130 years later, the Lord said, Jeremiah, if you get tired racing against people, how can you race against horses? If you can't even stand up in open country, how will you manage in the jungle by the Jordan? And I can tell you that a few years ago, we went to visit... Jordan and Israel and Egypt uh, and a group of Adventist people. 
and they had just discovered, just a, a short time before that, discovered the place where John the Baptist was actually baptizing on the Jordan side of, on the east side of the Jordan River. And so you could go down there if you knew exactly where to follow the little sign and to get to, to and, and I tell you, you you're, you're, you're sort of like this, trying to get through that stuff. It's up over your head. It's thick Was vines it and bushes and weeds and so forth like this. And you walk through a ways and then there's a place that yeah. they've actually are, uh, dug up, the archaeologists have dug up with, there's a, like a baptismal place and whatever like this. And then you go a little bit further over and there's the actual river itself. And we went there and we had someone that was baptized in, in the river right there. But I mean, this, that's thick stuff. Yeah. That is thick stuff. Something quite unexpected um, happened in this story. Isaiah took his son and under the direction of God sought out Ahaz to try to correct him in his evil plans. Notice two important things in this passage. One. God knew exactly where King Ahaz was at that moment and what he was doing. Two, with his foreknowledge, God knew that Kings Rezin and Pekah would not be able to conquer the land of Judah. They were nothing more than two smoldering sticks. He yeah. obviously didn't allow that to happen. Not that but my happen. question is, does he, does he sometimes make the arrows go straight and sometimes does he make the arrows go crooked? <laughs> You know, how, how, how does God do this? I don't know. It was their plan to put one of their associates, known as Tabil's son, on the throne and thus force Judah to join them in an attempt to frighten or destroy the Assyrians. It would have been a foolhardy task at best. And how was God involved in all that? And I should just add that uh, the Assyrians, their God was the God of war. That was the, I mean, anybody, any young man who rose up through the, among the children there, boy, if he, if he wanted to be someone in Assyria, you, you went off to war. Okay, Charles? Second Chronicles 28, 5 to 6 and 19. Because King Ahaz sinned, the Lord, his God, let the king of Syria defeat him and take a larger number of Judeans back to Damascus as prisoners. The Lord also led the king of Israel, Pekah, son of Ramaliah, defeat Ahaz and kill 120,000 of the bravest Judean soldiers in one day. Okay, now I want you to think about this. He's worried about these two, two nations. One, the Syrian army has come in from the, what we hear from you people watching, from the northwest, and they have conquered a huge chunk of, the, of Judah's territory already and taken off prisoners. The other one of these people has killed 120,000 of the bravest Judean soldiers in one day. I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible. I mean, you know, that would be a, what, a quarter of the men available for war yeah. at the time. It just, so no wonder he was scared. Yeah. Yes. Lord, the God of their ancestors, permitted this to happen because the people of Judah had abandoned him because King Ahaz of Judah had violated the rights of his people and had defied the Lord, the Lord brought troubles on Judah. Okay, I want you to notice that again. We, we read earlier, the Lord did this and so this Lord. Now the Lord brought troubles on Judah. What does that mean? How do we interpret that? We're going we're gonna to work on that. What was God trying to accomplish? Well, Isaiah 7, 3 Let's look at that really quick. We've looked at it already. But the Lord said to Isaiah, Take your son, share Jashub, and go to meet King Haz, and you will find him on the road where the cloth makers work at the end of the ditch that brings water from the upper pool. So there's no question about where he was supposed to go, what he was supposed to do, what the king was doing. Isaiah's son had a very unusual name, which meant a remnant shall return. And what was that supposed to mean? You know, you, you go hip up here and you're approaching the king. You're supposed to be respectful. And you say, King, please meet my son. His name is A Remnant Shall Return. Huh? It sounds a little unbold, doesn't and it? You're, and, and you're a prophet of God. So, who was the remnant? 
And where were they returning from? Was that a message from God about people going into captivity and only a few returning from captivity? Maybe. Yeah. That doesn't sound too... Not too many years from then. No? Yeah. Not too many. It is possible that the word return also carried the meaning of repentance. Is that what God was asking for? At least a remnant will repent? Looking back from our perspective, it seems clear that the message of God to Ahaz effectively was, you can, make it, can take it to mean whatever you think it should mean. If you do not turn from your sins and the children of Israel are going into captivity. It is true that a remnant will return from captivity, but at this point, the decision is up to you. And we're going to find out, uh, well, we won't be studying it this quarter, but when you get to the story of Jeremiah, and we get the story of Ezekiel, we're going to find out that Jeremiah, well, the king in Jeremiah's day, called Jeremiah and said, I, I, nighttime, I, I want to have a secret conference with you. And Jeremiah says, okay, let me just tell you very specifically what's going to happen. You can repent and, 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 and surrender to the Babylonians, and things will come out fairly good for all of you. If you do not, you and all your family and all your helpers and so forth, all of you will be killed. You... But Zedekiah says, but what would people think of me? I mean, it's just... And, you, and because he refused to repent, Jerusalem ended up being wiped out completely. Um, here we see choice mm -hmm. all along. I give you the choice. I even tell you what's coming. Yeah. Choose. <laughs> yeah. I, I just have a quick question. You know, I mean leadership even within the church around the world because of their choices common people like us perhaps hurt <laughs> you know look at what's happening 120,000 and look they, many of them are married they, yeah. uh, widows now kids mm -hmm. have no dad mm -hmm. because of the leader was not yeah that's so boring we do not know exactly how extensive the conversation was between Isaiah and the king. We do not know whether Isaiah's son said anything at all. But Isaiah clearly told King Ahaz, quote, There is no reason to be frightened. God will take care of things if you will just trust him. That was the message. No question about that. Then Isaiah went on to tell him that within 65 years, Israel would be shattered, too shattered to survive as a nation. Do you suppose that message also was carried to any of the people of Israel? In any case, Ahaz did not need to be worried about those attacks from Damascus and Samaria, the respective capitals of Syria and northern Israel. Ahaz needed to turn to someone who reliably could tell him the truth. And who would that be? Isaiah, through God, really God speaking through Isaiah, right? Yeah. So try to imagine yourself observing this discussion between a faithful follower of God, a prophet, and this wicked king who was even sacrificing his own children mm -hmm. to pagan gods. Did he say to Isaiah, well, good thing you didn't sacrifice this kid. I mean, you know, yeah. what was he thinking? Bizarre. The two men were both quite young and should have been able to communicate effectively. So then Isaiah went on to give an additional message, Isaiah 7, 10 through 13. The Lord sent another message to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God to give you a sign. It can be from deep in the world of the dead or from high up in heaven. Now, a message from deep in the world of the dead, what would that mean? Spirit is in the world. Okay, but what would, what would be a message? We're talking about tangible messages. Is he saying raising somebody from the dead? Not a whole uh, lot different than uh, King Saul and, and yeah. uh, the witch of Endor. But he's, here he's, God himself is promising, if you, want, if you want a message from a dead person, I will raise him to life here as your tangible evidence of, of whatever, you, to, to say what I'm, imagine it. That's pretty Powerful. Or from high up in heaven. I don't know whether that means bring somebody down from Moses, down from heaven maybe. Ahaz answered, I will not ask for a sign. I refuse to put the Lord to the test. 
To that, Isaiah replied, Listen now, descendants of King David, it's bad enough for you to wear out the patience of people. Must you wear out God's patience too? That's from my Good News Bible. Mm. Can you imagine such an offer? Basically, Ahaz, Ahaz could have asked for anything. Shouldn't Ahaz have jumped at that opportunity? I mean, could he just have asked God to take away the Syrians and the Israelites and the, and, and the Assyrians? I mean, wouldn't that have been the obvious thing? Oh, oh, God, if you're offering, okay, take care of the Assyrians, the Syrians, and the Israelites. Shouldn't that have been his... I mean, if he, And that would have happened. Yeah, it would have happened. There are other times mentioned in the Bible when kings made remarkable offers to people under them. Sometimes they offered as much as half of their kingdom. Yeah. That offer was made twice to Esther, Salome. Esther 5, 6, and 7, 2. Mm -hmm. And it was also made to Salome mm -hmm. after she danced before those bunch of drunk men mm -hmm. in Mark 6, 23. But Ahaz, stubborn as usual, answered, I will not ask for a sign. I refuse to put the Lord to the test. Well, doesn't it sound like a pious and respectful answer? You might, if you had only the words there, you didn't know in background, you might say, well, that's, that's being respectful. Look at it quickly from a little different point of view. Holy Spirit was in action in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and he grieved not the Holy Spirit. He perhaps did totally grieve the Holy Spirit. So even if a pro major prophet was there, yeah, ah, yeah. not going to go that way. We're not supposed to put God to the test, are we? Well, the ancient Israelites on their journey through the wilderness had put God to the test on several occasions. Jim? Exodus 17, 2. They complained to Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses answered, Why are you complaining? Why are you putting the Lord to the test? <clears throat> Gary? Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Okay, good news Bible again. And what about us? Are we ever supposed to test God? Of course, Malachi. Charles? Mm -hmm. Yes. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to test. Test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you in abundance all kinds of good things. Okay, are we supposed to be testing God? He's asking us to yeah, test him. Gideon tested him. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Wet fleece, dry fleece. <laughs> okay, back to Isaiah 7.13. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Hmm. So what are we supposed to learn from, the, from this experience? Could we ever be so blind and foolish as Ahaz was? Or are we so completely surrendered to God that we would never make such a mistake? Do you think that if Ahaz had actually chosen a sign for God to do and God had done it, Ahaz would have sincerely believed in the true God? He had no, the choice. I, I wonder what would have happened if he, you know, if he had said, yeah, okay, do this. Hmm. Would that have, I don't know. By far the most important passage for us in this chapter is Isaiah 7.14. Gary? Yeah. Well then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A young woman who is pregnant will have a son and will name him Emmanuel. And there's a footnote in here from the Good News Bible, young woman. The Hebrew word here, translated young woman, is not the specific term for virgin, but refers to any young woman of marriageable age. The use of virgin in, Ma in uh, Matthew, 1, Matthew 1, 23 reflects a Greek translation of the Old Testament made some 500 years after Isaiah. Then there's another footnote. Emmanuel, this name in Hebrew, means God is with us. I want you to notice that. This is very interesting. We make a big deal out about whether or not Mary was a complete virgin. And obviously, clearly, the New Testament, Matthew 1, 20, there's no question about the fact that Matthew says virgin. So where did that virgin idea come from? 
some translators uh -huh. 200 years before Jesus came to this earth, translating from Hebrew to Greek, didn't use the ordinary word for young woman, which they could have. They said Parthenos, a virgin. Where did they get well, that? Actual word it was uh, uh, Alma or something like that. Well, in Hebrew, the, the, a, young, a young woman. Of, the, <laughs> the, the the Hebrew word for a virgin is Bethula. Okay. And the w word for a young woman who's of marriageable age is Alma. Okay. But in Greek, the word for virgin is Parthenos. Right. And so these translators, two hundred years, one hundred fifty years, two hundred years, something like that. We don't know exactly what the sketch, exactly what the time was for that they decided that the word there should be virgin. And they put that in, and Matthew says, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we think about the inspiration. Were these translators inspired? Are they the scribes? Are no, well, would you call them scribes? Not the scribes in Jesus' day, for sure. <clears throat> so God went a second mile and said to Ahaz through Isaiah, if you won't suggest a sign, then I will. What would you have asked for if God had made that kind of an offer to you? Think of what God is capable of. I mean, look at a couple of verses. Isaiah 55, 9, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and thoughts above yours. So, and then 1 Corinthians 2, 9. However, as the scripture says, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. Wow. And so what did God suggest as a sign? The sign was a birth of a son. So how could a young woman bearing a child and calling him Emmanuel be a sign of biblical proportions? Can you think of other times when biblical characters ask God to give them a sign? Charles, what story did you suggest? The story of Gideon, right? Gideon, right. Yeah, and there it is, Judges 6, 36 to 40. I'm not going to take time to read it right now. I'm watching the clock up there. Uh, but Gideon said, give me a fleece. Well, but, you know, maybe it would automatically stay wet longer than the ground. Well, God, excuse me, can I have it the other way around? And God did it. Okay? He, he didn't kill him. I mean, so it's okay to question. That's all. Yeah. Said, Come now, let us reason together. Yep. We know that Matthew recorded Matthew one twenty three, quoted Isaiah 7.14, as a prediction of the virgin birth of Jesus to Mary, and quoting the Greek now. What is the relationship between that prophecy and the fulfillment? A prophecy in, in Isaiah 7, 14? Several suggestions have been made as to who th that young woman might have been. Many scholars think that it was a reference to Isaiah's wife. And we, why? Because Isaiah 8, 3 says, sometime later my wife became pregnant. When our son was born, the Lord said to me, name him Quick Loot Fast Blender. Okay, so we just said, we were, we're talking about a baby who was named Emmanuel. So where does this Quick Loot Fast Blender come from? A few verses later, Isaiah did record the birth of a son to his wife, the prophetess. Remember that Isaiah's wife was, in a sense, a prophetess as she gave birth to those prophetically named children. Remember that Isaiah's first son, Shear Jashub, had a name which meant, which means, a remnant shall return. Shortly after this encounter with Ahaz, Isaiah's wife gave birth to a second son, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, which means quick loot, fast plunder. What could that mean? And, I, and you probably all recognize it. Meher Shalal Hashbaz is the longest the name in the name Bible. Bible. We used to get that in quizzes all the time and so forth. Okay. Isaiah 8, 1 to 4. Where are we? Is that me? Okay. I said 1 to 4. The Lord said to me, take a large piece of writing material and write on it in large letters. Quick look, fast plunder. Get two reliable men, the priest, Uriah and Zechariah, son of Jeberekiah, yeah. to serve as witnesses. Some time later, my wife became pregnant. When the son was born, the Lord said to me, Name him Quick Look Fast Blunder. Before the boy is old enough to say, Mommy and Daddy, 
all the wealth of Damascus and all the lords of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. Wow, from our Good News Bible. Well, other scholars, so there's one possibility. It was Isaiah's son that was supposed to be the Emmanuel. But Isaiah's son was with Isaiah when he met with Ahab. That, that's the first son. The, the, fir the first son was called Shear Jashub. Right. He was the one entitled, whose name meant a remnant shall return. Yes. This is now the second son. The, His name is Mehershal Hashbaz, yeah. and uh, which means quick loot, fast plunder. Or there's other way it, is it can be translated, but that idea. We're now talking about the next son. Okay. Other scholars have suggested that Emmanuel was Hezekiah, the son of Hez, because Hezekiah, Hezekiah was one of the good kings. Yes. Who became the next king? But nowhere in the Bible is the name Emmanuel applied to Hezekiah. So, yeah. That makes it a little questionable, right? Others have suggested that Emmanuel, God with us, applies exclusively to the Messiah to be born 700 years later. What's wrong with that theory? That explanation? Seems, seems good. How can, how can he be there a couple years later saying mommy and daddy yeah. if he wasn't born until 700 years later? Clearly, that part of Isaiah's prophecy referred to the future Messiah. So, we do have some verses coming up. And Isaiah 9, 6, I'll read that. A child is born to us. A son is given to us, and he will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, from the Good News Bible. Jim? Isaiah 10, 11. Make it 11, 10. Isaiah 11, 10. A day is coming when the new king from the royal line of David will be a symbol to the nations. They will gather to his holy city, excuse me, his royal city, and give him honor. Good news, Bible. So is it a possibility that a natural birth to an unmarried woman of marriageable age, resulting in an illegitimate child through illegal prom promiscuity, could be a sign from God? <laughs> Now, why would they say that? Why is he asking that question? You need to understand the history of English translations. Because if you go, as a result of the bent toward Christianity, the King James Version says, well, I don't have it up here right now, let's bother with it right now. But it says, a virgin shall give birth to a child. And what would that be in the case of, I mean, if you don't recognize the possibility, if, if you, unless you think there's another Jesus somewhere, that birth to a virgin in the Old Testament would have to have been an illegitimate birth. Right? Right. And what do we know about those illegitimate births? Well, why would such a child be assigned to inspire faith? Look at what Look at what God said about it in Deuteronomy 22. But if the charge is true and there is no proof that she was a virgin, then they are to take her out to the entrance of her father's house where the men of her city are to stone her to death. She has done a shameful thing among our people by having intercourse before she was married while she was still living in her father's house. In this way, you will get rid of this evil. In light of those verses, should they have done that to Mary? All the Jews to this day hated. They, they said she had an affair with a Roman soldier. I think they even give the name in Talmud. As we know, Matthew 1, 21 through 23 makes it very clear that Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus, the Son of God. Matthew 1, 21 and 23. Um, Charles? No, that's me. Here. Are you next? Oh yeah, I've been, you've been picking on me quite a bit, but I, that's fine. <laughs> Matthew 1, 21, 23. <laughs> that's all right. Okay, let me do it. Matthew 1, 21 to 23. Shall we have a son and you will name him? She will have a son and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this happened in order to make what the Lord had said through the prophet come true. A virgin will become pregnant and have a son and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. 
Now, it doesn't say there how this virgin became preg pregnant, does it? No. Someone it says of the Holy Spirit? Well, we know that from other places. It doesn't say that here. No, not, not here. And there are many other verses suggesting that Jesus was the divine son of God and of the royal line of David. We have plenty of evidence from that, both from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. Well, shortly after the Revised Standard Version came out about 70 years ago, there were so many questions about Bible translation that the General Conference Committee took an action to establish a special committee on problems in Bible translation. They worked on this problem for about two or three years and produced a book entitled Problems in Bible Translation. Notice these words of conclusion. Summary and conclusion. The doctrine of the virgin birth is implicit throughout the scriptures and would stand firm even if it, even if it did not appear in Isaiah 7, 14 and Matthew 1, 23. So, what are we? What is that first point? What does that say to us? There is no question about the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, that He's not the Son of some human father. Mary was a virgin. These, these are these are un, 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 You can't argue. It's it's yeah. not real. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Two, the word Alma. A virgin denotes, and it's not really virgin, it should be translated young, denotes simply a young woman of marriageable age, whether engaged or not, married or not, virgin or not. Okay? So it can be any combination. Yeah. The word Bethula, three, is the Hebrew word for virgin. Isaiah used it repeatedly. So he knew about the word. God could have given him, asked him to use that word. He did not use that word. The Holy Spirit would have guided him in the choice of Bethula in chapter 7, 14, if it had been essential to exp express what, he had been, uh, revealed, what had been revealed to him. Okay, so it doesn't say virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. So how, do, how come Isaiah 7, 14, we have virgin in, in the King James Version? They put it together from the other places of the scriptures. Because it's Christians translating the Old Testament. Yeah. They said, we know from Matthew 1.23 that this is quoted, and over Matthew 1.23 it says virgin. So therefore it has to say virgin back in Isaiah, even though it didn't say that. That's, that's what happened. Yeah. Isaiah and his sons were signs divinely ordained to accompany Isaiah's prophetic ministry, the chief object of which was to hold Judah steady as the northern kingdom collapsed and went into captivity. God is trying to hold Judah together and keep them from just completely panicking as the kingdom right a few miles from Jerusalem is taken into Babylon, into Assyrian captivity. Um, the Alma, translated virgin in Isaiah 7.14, was evidently Isaiah's own wife. And Emmanuel was to have been the name of their son. So what was the baby supposed to be named? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Why was he not named Emmanuel? I was told to name him Mar Shalom Ashbash. Why? Because of what the king did. Because the king refused to accept Isaiah's re you know, recommendations. So this Meher Shalah we, we should never have heard of that name. He was supposed to be named Emmanuel. Okay. As a refusal, they has to submit to God. Thus, the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 had a focal and literal fulfillment in the days of Isaiah. This was the committee put together by the General Conference to, a to analyze these verses. Six, by inspiration, Matthew was led to see in the, historic, the historical circumstances and prophetic message of Isaiah 7.14 a prophecy of the virgin birth of the Messiah. And he had already been helped by the fact that some translator had put virgin in the, Hebrew, in the, in the Greek 150 years or 200 years before he came along. And to use the word parthenos, meaning virgin, and quoting the prophecy. 
7. The prophecy of Isaiah 7.14, thus viewed, is a dual prophecy having an immediate and primary application to the days of Isaiah and a secondary and later, but nevertheless a meaningful and vital application to the birth of Messiah. General Conference Committee, Problems in Bible Translation, 160-169, 1954. It, quickly, in both instances, the folk that were involved immediately at the time refused to accept. Yeah. Yeah. They refused to accept. Yeah. We've already noticed that Isaiah's first son, Sheher Jashub, had a name which means a remnant shall return. Meher Shalal Hashbaz, his second son, had a name which means swift is booty, speedy is prey. That's another way of translating that for that name. It is also true that Emmanuel has a meaning translated literally from the Hebrew is with us God. But we know from looking at other names in Hebrew that the verb to be is often omitted and is supplied by the English translators. So in this case we should translate it God is with us. What greater promise could we claim than to have God with us? Jim? Psalms 23:4. Even if I go through the deepest darkness I am not afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. Good News Bible. God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, Isaiah 43, 2. So, let's take some examples. Where was the Lord when the Babylonians threw Daniel's three friends into the fire? With them. Yeah. Daniel 3, 23 to 25. And where was the Lord during the time of Jacob's trouble when he was wrestling un until daybreak? In, in, Jacob, <laughs> in, in Jacob's arms. <laughs> right. As close as he could get. Genesis 32, 24 through 30. Even when the Lord does not appear in physical form on earth, he goes through the experiences of his people with them. Where was the Lord when the mob condemned Stephen? Standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7.55. But when Jesus ascended to heaven, he, quote, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1.3. Why did he stand when Stephen was in trouble, about to be stoned to death? As Morris Bennon has said, Jesus wasn't going to take that sitting down. That's from Roy Gain, God's Faulty Heroes. So if you're facing some real problems, is it, help, is it helpful to know that God is with you? I certainly hope so. Yeah, yes. Even if he does not intervene in any way, Gary? His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen, quote, in the face of Jesus Christ, unquote. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God. And that was in inverted commas. The image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory, again, that's in quotes. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love to be God with us. Therefore, it was prophesied of him. His name shall be called Emmanuel. This is from Desire of Ages. Page 19, paragraph 1, that's like almost the very first paragraph right. in the book. Yeah. So what was the conclusion with Ahaz? Well would it have been for the kingdom of Judah, I'm sorry, Charles, that should be yours. <laughs> well would it have been for the kingdom of Judah had Ahaz received this message as from heaven, but choosing to lead Lean. Lynn on the arm of flesh, he sought him help from the heathen. In desperation, he sent word to Tiglath Pilsar, king of Assyria, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hands of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which is rise up against me. Second Kings 16:7. The request was accompanied by a rich present from the king's treasure and from the temple storehouse. Ellen White, Patricks and Prophets 329, paragraph 2. Yeah. Taking money from the temple that Solomon built to try to buy off a pagan king. Mm. 
So what are we supposed to learn from this lesson? Should we ask for a sign from the Lord to guide us? It is always appropriate to ask for God's guidance and help, but to ask for a specific sign in many cases would be presumption. We need to have enough faith to allow God to assist us, or not, apparently, in the way he chooses. Ahaz apparently chose not to believe God, and thus alienated himself from the kingdom of God. Are we ever inclined to forget that God is constantly present and looking at, after us? Did Isaiah and or Ahaz ever have any idea that a Messiah born to a virgin would come about 700 years later? Did either of them think that Isaiah 7.14 was a prophecy of that future birth? I doubt it. Yeah. God coming and reaching out to Ahaz should remind us of the story of Adam and Eve in the garden after their sin. In fact, God is reaching out to every one of us. It is not easy to just keep calm when a panicky situation is before us, but that is sometimes what God tells us to do. Take heed and be quiet, and be careful, keep calm. In the Hebrew language, the clause, the clause take heed and be quiet, it consists of two words, and I'm jumping over that. The first word comes from the verbal root shamir, which in this case could be translated as to be on one's God, to be attentive, to take care. The other word, to keep the peace, to keep oneself quiet, on there's the reference there. So, in other words, a possible translation for Shamir could be, look quietly. Are we able to do that in our chaotic times? Isaiah condemns two things in Ahaz. His fear, for it is needless. His faith in material resources here typified by a secure water supply and in time of siege, the only faith that will secure the real solidity of the state is faith in, in Yahweh. So he's suggesting that uh, Ahaz is out there checking on the water supply because of the, the armies are after him. Let us conclude with these words from Ellen White. You may be perplexed in business, your prospects may grow darker and darker, and you may be threatened with loss, but do not become discouraged. Cast your care upon God and remain calm and cheerful. Pray for wisdom to manage your affairs with discretion and thus prevent loss and disaster. Do all you can on your part to bring about favorable results. Jesus has promised his aid, but not apart from our effort. When relying upon our helper, we, you have de when, re when relying upon our helper, you have done all you can, accept the result cheerfully. And that's what God challenges each one of us to do. Let's pray. <coughs> our wonderful Father, we thank you for the lessons that are here for us in this pass these passages of Scripture. Imagine the incredible prophecy of, of telling Isaiah this message that 700 years later would be a message to, to encourage us with the birth of the Messiah. And yet, Lord, so often we, we pass over these passages and we don't hardly even stop to think about them as we read through. May we take them more seriously now as a result of this study together as our prayer and our belief together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.